I was just looking on Reddit the other day and I saw this question, is using water runoff from roads safe? Hey folks, my name is Rob Avis. I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been practicing engineering for close to 18 years. I've been teaching permaculture for close to 15. And today we're going to be looking at some designs uh, on the internet, uh, good, bad, and ingenious to see what we can learn from them. If you haven't already done so, Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We're gonna be putting out lots of content like this, as well as lots of other really informative permaculture content that's gonna help you to build your property. Now let's get into the video and look at some of these designs so that we can learn what to do and what not to do. One of the best ways to learn how to do these things is to see how not to do them. And in this first picture here, we've got a rainwater harvesting setup. And actually I see a lot of these online. Um, there's three tanks kind of stacked on top of each other. And I'll tell you one thing, I love rainwater harvesting. And so what I've noticed in my 15 years doing permaculture is that the blue rainwater harvesting barrel, I refer to as the gateway drug to rainwater harvesting because people don't realize how much volume their roof produces. And so these barrels are only 50 gallons, 200 liters, and a roof will produce thousands of liters in a decent rain event. So you're really not gonna collect very much and also you probably don't know much about gardening or growing things if you're only storing, you know, 600 liters in these three tanks here. Uh, because if you're in a, an environment that needs irrigation, there's just not very much water there to irrigate with. The things that stand out for me in this first picture is that the plumbing uh, is going to be really expensive. By the time you add up all the plumbing fittings, all the wood, and all the time that you've put in to build this, you might as well just buy a proper rainwater harvesting tank. The other thing people don't realize is that water is super heavy. And so if this thing ever tips over, that's 600 kilograms or almost 1400 pounds. So there's a lot of mass there. It could literally go through the wall of your house. And then I don't love how they've taken the water from the gutter down into the tanks here with all these weeping tiles. Uh, you know, any of these fittings look like they could fall off at any moment. And one of the worst things you can do to a house is to put piles and piles of water around the foundation. In fact, I see a lot of houses where the water's not properly managed coming off of the roof and it creates foundation issues. So the next one's kind of a similar setup, uh, expensive frame, less plumbing this time, but still a lot of plumbing fittings. Like all those black pipes are connected with a bulkhead fitting, which is a through wall fitting. Those are like 20 or 30 bucks each. And then you got to drill a hole in there, tie them all together. And so you do all this work and all you're getting is 600 liters of water. I mean, to put that in perspective, the average person living in a house uses between three and 400 liters a day, just doing regular stuff, not even including irrigation. So this is about a little bit more than one person's daily water consumption. Uh, and if I had to quickly add up how much this would cost, probably like three, 400 bucks, a big 600 gallon rainwater tank is probably just a little bit more money than that, depending on where you're getting it from. So again, you'd have less fittings, more water storage, uh, which would be more useful and a lot less time putting it all together. So again, I'd, I'd stay away from these blue barrels generally. Do the rainwater calculations as we talk about in our book, Essential Rainwater Harvesting, and you'll find that you need quite a bit bigger tank, but it doesn't cost as much as you think. If you're interested in learning more about this, the Verge website has tons of videos and also uh, blogs on how to properly set up a rainwater harvesting tank. So in this second video, we've got a urban gardener, it looks like, who's trying to show folks how to build a hookah culture bed. Generally speaking, hookah culture is kind of a neat idea. It was something that was developed by, I believe, Sepp Holzer in Austria. And it involves putting wood in the bottom of your garden. And it can be a really great way of building fungal communities in your soils. Something you have to think about if you are using a hookah culture system is that certain vegetables do not like to grow in soil that has a lot of fungal uh, dominance, specifically uh, the brassicas, so things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, they prefer bacterially dominant soils. The other thing is that a lot of hookah cultures get built without the raised bed that you see in this particular video. And if you live in an arid climate like I do, hookah cultures are generally not a great idea because they tend to dry out really quickly. Lastly, if you are going to try and save money filling your raised beds with soil, don't buy them in 20 liter bags and get bulk soil super cheap, 20, 30 bucks a yard. And so to fill all of these gardens up, I would bet you it would cost only 40 bucks and you'd have none of the garbage that uh, is shown at the end of this video. Overall though, I really like raised beds and these types of uh, steel beds like this video shows. And I think that this sort of a hookah culture approach would be something that I'd actually even consider doing, even though I've done very little with hookah culture because of the climate that I live in. 
So I have to say, I, I generally like the idea overall. I would just buy bulk soil as opposed to buying it in a pallet in bags. In the next video, we're gonna look at an earth ship. One of the things that I absolutely love about earth ships is that they use gar garbage, basically, that is native to planet earth now. It's become endemic. And if you've never seen an earth ship, they're built out of tires and beer cans. And so you have to drink lots of beer and you have to go collect lots and lots of tires. Now, the thing that's a bit misleading is that each tire has about 400 pounds of earth in it. And you have to fill those tires manually, one bucket at a time, and then you have to take a sledgehammer and you've got to pound that earth into the tire itself. Michael Reynolds, who is the kind of father of the earthship concept, I was saying that like a really good tire pounder could pound anywhere from six to 10 tires a day and that the average earthship has between 1200 and 1800 tires in it. So there's lots of earthships around the earth that have never been finished because people just get so disillusioned with pounding earth into tires. I've had a lot of clients come to me and want me to design earthships for them uh, because they want to build a cost-effective house, but I usually talk them out of it specifically for the tire pounding reasons. Another thing that I've noticed on earthships is that they tend to put their front solar glazing diagonally, similar to a passive solar greenhouse. If you talk to builders, specifically builders that specialize in envelope design, they will tell you that diagonal windows are almost guaranteed to leak at some point in their life. But because the Earthship combines the greenhouse with the living space, uh, it does become a big deal and you can end up with toxic mold situations. The other thing that people don't realize when they're putting this much glazing on a house is that they overheat. I've lived inside of these Earthships. So you always have to be opening vents and closing them. A, a, a well-designed passive solar house will only have about 12 to 20% of their southern glazing surface in, in glass. When we build a passive house with more than 12% glazing on the south surface, those houses are guaranteed to overheat. So every percentage above 12%, we have to add a lot of thermal mass. And so the Earthship proponents will say, well, we have lots of thermal mass. We have these 400 pound tires, which sap up the thermal energy. And that is true to a point, uh, but these buildings have a high propensity of overheating. And because they've got greenhouses in the front of them, they also have a high propensity towards getting overhumidified. Um, one thing you have to be really cautious about when you do build into the side of the earth though is radon. So radon is a naturally occurring radioactive material that emerges from subsoils. And because these are built with subsoils all around them, you can end up uh, filling your house up with radon and it's odorless so you can't smell it, it doesn't have any color, and it's actually the leading cause of lung cancer in North America, uh, second to smoking. So you gotta be really careful about that and make sure you test your soils before you go and build one of these things. Overall, the, the design of this particular Earthship is fairly simple, um, and uh, I do really like small, simple designs that are multifunctional, and I'm sure it's a, an absolute joy to live within, um, other than some of the uh, you know, constraints or concerns that I, I mentioned at the beginning. That might sound that I'm getting really negative about Earthships, but I wanted to say that Earthships uh, have pioneered some really important ideas in the building space. So number one, they're very water efficient. And so they use their water three or four times within the system. These buildings are also really uh, easy to heat, generally speaking, because of the amount of thermal mass, because of the, the amount of solar gain. As a solar punk solution to all the craziness that goes on in the world, there's a lot that the Earthships have gotten right. Take the best of what the Earthship concept provides and then improve upon it. If you're looking at building in an alternative way, I can highly recommend all of Chris Magwood's books. He's got a lot of great books on building with straw and a variety of other materials that kind of get the same essence of what we're trying to get at with the Earthship, but in a slightly more modern way uh, that has a little bit more building science. I was just looking on Reddit the other day and I saw this question, is using water runoff from roads safe? This is a really great question for so many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons people get concerned about this is because our cars release toxins. The, the brakes are typically made out of a toxic material that wear down over time and so those accumulate in the water. Uh, we can have oil drips coming off of our cars. And, uh, and so the thing is, is that if we don't accumulate it, where does it end up going? It goes into the oceans, it goes into rivers, it goes into lakes. Now, here's the good news. There's this thing called microbial infallibility, which is basically, uh, biologists have coined that term in saying that they have never found a situation on Earth where microbes have not been able to decompose, bioaccumulate, 
or make benign any toxic product on earth, including nuclear uh, products of nuclear fission. And in fact, one of the greats uh, practicing permaculture right now, Brad Lancaster has shown this in Tucson, Arizona, where he's created water harvesting features in the boulevard or in the verge and the water comes off of the road and it gets harvested in a mulched basin where he grows a mesquite tree and a bunch of other native plants and they've actually taken tissue culture from the trees from the leaves and from the mesquite pods the mesquite pods are things that we consume and they found that the trees did in fact bioaccumulate the stuff on the road heavy metals and other such products the leaves actually accumulated it as well but the mesquite pods did not which meant that the tree was able to distinguish which things should go to the pod and which things should go to the tree. And it also means that the trees were acting as a filter to clean the water up. So should you harvest water off of roads? Absolutely you should. If you bring this onto your property, number one, you're not allowing it into the streams, creeks, and uh, oceans. Number two, if you use permaculture principles and you harvest this in a swale or some water harvesting feature, placing that water directly in contact with biology, if you do it properly, and you just have to make sure that you are functioning or building systems that are functioning with nature, that encourage the right microbes, fungi and bacteria, and then are planting plants that can actually put these products to, to productive use because waste is just an unused resource. One thing that I love about permaculture and alternative building is that there is so much creativity out there. And so you can get a lot of ideas, but you really have to do your research because you can end up going down rabbit trails that will cost you way more time and way more money. And so just be careful about all the stuff that you see on the internet and really give it some thought uh, before you go and plunge into uh, doing some of these creative ideas. Thanks so much for sticking with me to the end. I really enjoy looking at other people's creative work. Um, one of the things that I love about the space of alternative building and permaculture is that people really do put a lot of love and creativity into these designs to try and find better ways of doing things. If you have any designs that you want us to critique or you've got videos or photos that you'd love an expert's opinion on, please put links down in the show notes down below. We'll check up on that and take a look at it. If you're looking to dive deep into permaculture, we have an upcoming PDC. We have an incredible staff of instructors and faculty that help give you the best advice. One of the problems with the internet uh, is that there's so much content out there that it becomes really difficult for an individual to know what's good and what's bad. And you can waste a lot of time and a lot of money. And so the biggest thing that you get out of a PDC is really being able to have that critical thinking mind so that you end up saving all the time and a lot of money to get the perfect permaculture design. So if you haven't hit subscribe, make sure you do so and we'll see you in an upcoming video.